On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority and Kendall Outreach, I'd like to welcome you to this web conference titled, Skin Infections, What's Bugging Them? My name is Chris Mamrell, and I'll be your moderator for this program. Today's conference is 60 minutes, including Q&A, and will be recorded. This webinar will be available on the Authority's YouTube channel in a few weeks. To stay up to date on all educational videos from the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority, please subscribe to the Authority's YouTube channel by clicking on the link provided in the chat box found on the right-hand side of your screen. If you do not see the chat window, click on the chat icon in the top right-hand corner of your screen and you should see the chat box open up. A copy of today's slides are available using the link provided in the chat box. Also, on the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a poll question. If you didn't already, please take a few moments of your time to participate in the polling question. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the webinar. Linda Natow is working for Kendall Outreach on the PARRI grant as a consultant on long-term care facilities throughout the eastern region of PA regarding care practices, including wound prevention, treatment, and identification. The grant gives free support to nursing homes anywhere in PA through consultation and education and process change for many aspects of care. Linda has provided many educational presentations to nursing home staff on various care practices that affect the quality of life of residents and staff care practices. Prior to nursing, Linda worked for 22 years in basic and industrial molecular biology, microbiology research, and animal physiology. She's presented in both careers at the local, state, and national levels. Linda, now I'll turn the program over to you. Thanks, Chris. So before we get uh, started, I want to let you know that uh, the planners and presenters have no conflict of interest related to this education activity. So the objectives for today's uh, webinar are to describe changes in aging skin that predisposes it to infection. We're also going to discuss some common and maybe some not so common skin infections. We're going to explore prevention and treatment more on a general level and not on a uh, specific level, though you'll see some cases um, as we go through. And when it comes to skin infections, we usually think bacteria, but there are other things that can infect the skin, and any infection can lead to complications, especially in older skin. So when you start thinking about risk for skin infections, you need to consider things like age, but also what is the current health of the person? What is their lifestyle? Do they come in contact with possible infective agents? Do they have any recent surgery? Are there breaks in their skin or is there problems with their skin integrity? Is the skin too moist or too dry? What about the pH? You know, normally skin is acidic. Are we using products that bring that pH level up and away from acidity? Is there a circulation problem with that person? Do they have problems with their immune status? How about comorbidities? Do they have any of those that could possibly affect uh, predisposition for infections? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to open up a poll. Which of the following diseases do not increase risk of skin infections? So you know, look at this list. Vote on the right-hand side of the poll question, and then we'll end up um, getting the results in a minute, and then we'll talk a little bit about what our results are. So if we look at this list, you would probably very quickly rule out things like diabetes and uh, congestive heart failure and HIV, and hopefully you ruled out uh, any of the liver and renal diseases because those are going to affect the immune response and they're also going to affect vascular efficiency. And so the answer to this was number three, pneumonia. Uh, because pneumonia, of course, primarily affects lungs. So let's, uh, let's talk about, let's see if I can move this on here. Let's talk about older skin in particular and the risks that are involved in that. So as a person ages, the function and structure of the skin is going to change. And we're going to talk about that a little more detail in the next slide. 
In addition to those changes, the person also has a higher predisposition for malnutrition. So maybe they aren't eating all their protein, maybe they aren't being hydrated enough, that kind of stuff. They also have, unfortunately, a higher chance of having obesity, and that's going to affect the skin. And we'll talk about that as we go through. We'll see that coming up over and over again as a risk factor. There's also external forces that stress older skin. So things like sun and UV exposure. Now, that doesn't mean that we should not take our residents, our elders outside. Um, no, it just means that we need to protect them. So when we take them out in summer, we're going to put a sunblock on. When we take them out in winter, we're going to make sure they're really well moisturized. There's also environmental pollution, and, and that's going to vary from location to location, but even internal environment. You know, I was at uh, a healthcare facility. It wasn't a nursing home, but a healthcare facility recently, and they had fans on the ceiling, and the fan was off. And when I looked up, there was all this crap on that fan. It made me think I need to go home and clean mine, but it was really not very nice looking. And so that kind of pollution and in, in general environmental things like the dryness, the temperature in your facility. Older people tend to be less mobile. And so we may think, well, that's not so bad because they're not going to fall, they're not going to get skin tears, there won't be, you know, breaks in their skin. But actually, mobility, we know that that's linked to general health. So mobility is going to help prevent falls because that person is going to be stronger. Not falling, they're not going to be injuring themselves. It actually helps immunity. It helps uh, cognition. So mobility overall is a good thing, and we should encourage that. Um, as you get older, you tend to have more chronic diseases, and unfortunately, that often means that you end up with more medications also. Um, also, as you get older, your immune system starts to decline. So that includes both humoral, which is the antibodies, the B cells, and cell-mediated. For skin infections, cell-mediated is very important, and that's the part of the immunity that uses no antibodies, but it uses phagocytes, killer T cells, cytokines, things like that. Um, and then, um, let's see, we'll also, you, we talked about environment and how it can cause dryness, but in general, because of things like uh, less sebaceous glands, less eccrine glands, there's going to be less oil, less sweat, so the skin is naturally drier. So this is actually then a schematic of what skin looks like, so younger skin versus older skin. So you see that there's a lot of changes in skin structure and function because of the aging. Uh, the epidermis starts to thin, it loses its reti, and that's this kind of Velcro-like connection to the dermis, which, which is why you have a, a higher predisposition for uh, skin tears and uh, and um, also like sliding injuries, uh, shearing injuries. There's going to be a decrease in water retention. You're going to have less cell replacement going on. The barrier function is, uh, is less. And then, of course, wound healing decreases. So the dermis also becomes thinner, and you can see that the structure clearly changes. Uh, there's less elastin, less collagen, uh, less fibroblasts. And I mentioned the eccrine sweat glands shrink. They secrete less sweat. The sebaceous glands are reduced, so there's less oil. So that really affects things. Also, the Langerhan cells decrease in number, and they are directly um, what affects immune responsiveness in the skin. So all those changes in someone who's over 65 means that their skin is more fragile, it's drier, it's thinner, less hair follicles, um, and those age-related changes really increase the risk of skin infections. And the other thing, and one of the reasons why it does that is because they're more prone to what's known as micro-injuries. So you have these little cracks in the skin, and that opens the way for pathogens to enter and produce infection. 
So here are some comorbidities that increase the risk for skin infections. When you look at this list, I'm sure they're very familiar to you because many of your elders have these kinds of issues. And again, when you look at them, what you're seeing is that there's a decrease in vascularity, there's a decrease in oxygenation. You have increased peripheral fluid spaces, which leads to peripheral edema. There's a higher risk for skin trauma because of some of these, like obesity is a perfect example. Decreased ability to combat infections. And let me just give you an example. I'm, go I'm gonna pick on diabetes and it is something that we should pick on. Uh, it causes a lot of uh, secondary problems. But diabetes will actually increase the risk of infection-associated complications five-fold. So you can see how these kinds of things really impact skin infections or infections in general sometimes. Medications also are going to increase if the person has these comorbidities and that can affect immune responsiveness and of course it's going to increase uh, adverse effects. There is a risk of infections. Okay, so I realize that prolonged hospitalization is not really a comorbidity, but we know that there's a high risk for infections that are related to healthcare facilities. The one thing that's not on this list that I recently learned is depression. And depression actually has a negative impact on the immune response. So really the bottom line is that elders, especially those with comorbidities, are going to be at higher risk for skin infections. So let's actually get into some of the more common skin infections. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have another poll. And uh, the poll number two is which of the following is not a causative agent for skin infections? And, it, and this one's a little harder, guys. So uh, I will tell you that as you look at this list, in case you're not familiar with these things, Staphylococcus aureus is a bacteria. Candida albicans is a yeast. Herpes simplex virus is obviously a virus. Plasmodium is a protozoa. And scabies is a bug. I'm hoping that most of you have chosen number four, plasmodium. And plasmodium is actually a protozoa, as I mentioned before, that causes malaria. And it is true that it's carried by a mosquito which injects it into the skin, but that's not where it infects. So the answer is plasmodium. And we're going to go through these other ones as, as we go. So let's start with bacteria because bacteria are really the, one of the most common causes for skin infections. And really the two bacteria that are most commonly found in skin infections are the group A streptococcus. Uh, and so here we have, um, this is beta hemolytic streptococcus pyogenes on a blood auger plate. And this is um, hemolytic to red blood cells. That's why it's, um, it's streaked out onto this auger plate. And you can see that it licenses cells and you see a clear or white spot. And you know that this is kind of like a diagnostic test for uh, streptococcus pyogenes. The other more, most common bacteria involved in skin infections is Staphylococcus aureus. And so this is an electron micrograph and the uh, green is a, a staph aureus. Of course, they're not naturally this color. This is colorized, so it's easier to see it. You can see one over here that wasn't colorized. And what is happening is this white cell is destroying the staph aureus. Now, probably the more infamous uh, bacteria in the staph aureus is the methicillin-resistant staph aureus, or MRSA. And actually, the background of these slides are uh, uh, MRSA cells, and of course they aren't normally purple, they're colorized so they're, they look cool. <laughs> and then there's two other bacteria on this uh, slide, and this one is Klebsiella, again colorized, it's a micrograph, it's kind of a short rod, and then this is a cartoon of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and both of these are anaerobes, which means that they do not like oxygen. They will not grow in the presence of oxygen. So they're going to be underneath things. They're going to be underneath. So in general, we can categorize bacterial infections into uncomplicated, which means that 
um, you, you know, you, you put a treatment on it and it responds and everything's fine. And then there's complicated, and complicated means that two of these five criteria are met. And I guess when I, when I first thought of this, um, the first thing that comes to my mind is infected pressure ulcers. Um, so if you think about them, they obviously involve a pre-existing wound, the pressure ulcer, and now it got infected. Uh, they involve deeper tissue very often. They may require surgical in intervention. Um, they certainly can be worsened by comorbidity. And sometimes if it's something like MRSA that's infecting it, they may be unresponsive to antibiotic therapy or they may reoccur. The other one that we may not think of as readily is um, cellulitis. And cellulitis will sometimes be around the pre-existing wound. Sometimes it's involving deeper tissue. Um, sometimes it's definitely comorbidity associated, and it, it often reoccurs. So, you know, that's, those are just two examples of complicated skin infections. So let's actually start talking about some of these and, and, and name them. So we're, cellulitis is one of the most common ones, uh, bacterial skin infection. And I just want to point out this erysipelas. And erysipelas is really superficial. It's hard to tell the difference between erysipelas and cellulitis. Cellulitis goes deep. And so it is typical, you see in this picture, uh, cellulitis versus non-cellulitis, it's ill-defined, erythema, there's pain, edema. The pain is often worse when you palpate. There could be blisters, there could be exudate, um, the draining lymph nodes can be palpable and sometimes they're very tender, and cellulitis often reoccurs. Um, when you look at, uh, at, the, at the symptoms that are involved in cellulitis, if it goes systemic, if it ends up being a sepsis, you're also going to see some fever, some malaise, some confusion. Uh, and of course, it is usually caused by staphylococcus or streptococcus, which are the big two bacteria. Um, you again see that I mentioned obesity being a cause for many of these, and, and that is one of the risk factors. So the next one I'm talking about is not as common, but it certainly is, is very um, uh, severe. It's necrotizing fasciitis, and it is indeed life-threatening. Um, the thing with this flesh-eating disease is that in the very early stages, you may have a fever, it may be mild, but it progresses very quickly, and the person becomes septic, and they may have, like, toxic shock-like syndrome. So you can see on this picture of uh, necrotizing fasciitis that the skin is dusky red. You may also have associated gaseous crepitation, so it's crackling sounds coming from the wound. You could have a putrid discharge. Um, and you do want to um, keep, the interesting thing is that you would think this would be very painful, but pain is often absent because there's minimal cutaneous sensation is basically lost. So it is usually polymicrobial, which means that there's several bacteria involved. Streptococci is one, and then the anaerobes, Klebsiella and Pseudomonas, that's what makes that crepitation. So the risk factors are, are multiple. Um, recent surgery is one. Uh, irradiation, cancer, diabetes, uh, our old enemy there. Obesity, of course, and malnutrition. So some other... Uh, common skin infections, one of the other most common is infected ulcers. So the hallmark of an infected ulcer is that it doesn't heal or it stops healing if it's in the middle of healing. So this picture pretty much shows it, uh, I hope now you're eating your lunch right now, but this kind of shows what, you know, an extreme infected ulcer would look like. You have sloth, you have exudate, you have a malodor a lot of times. Um, there may be redness and or warmth, uh, peri wound, and um, if, it's, if the sloth is green, it's probably pseudomonas, by the way. 
Um, but you're going to use, you need to use systemic antibiotics for this. You're going to need some sort of addressing. You're probably going to need some sort of pain medication because, I mean, it looks like it hurts. So you can imagine uh, what it's like. You also may need enzymatic or surgical debridement, you know, to get rid of that sloth and to promote the healing. Uh, I kind of teased out MRSA when we're talking about this because it's such a significant uh, bacteria that, that causes many different kinds of, or can infect many different kinds of uh, skin problems, wounds, cellulitis, surgical sites. And when you look at it, and here's a picture of a MRSA infected wound, you really can't differentiate it from a non MRSA infected wound. So you have to do a bacterial culture for it. And the symptoms are going to be the same. And it can go systemic. So you really need to do that culture and sensitivity to make sure that you are, you know, obviously not using the wrong kind of uh, antibiotics for that. Another thing you may see is, uh, again, older skin tends to be dry, so you may have some pruritus, and then people will scratch it. Uh, especially our residents who have dementia who may not be aware that this is not a good thing to do, but even some of us who ha don't have dementia scratch that uh, pruritus of some sort, and it can develop into secondary infection. So you want to keep in mind keeping those symptoms under control using emollients and antihistamines. So here are some other ones, maybe not super common, but just kind of things that you can keep in mind. Infotigo, we usually associate with kids, uh, but older people definitely can get it. And um, it's going to be either that Staph aureus or Strep pyogenes. And so it starts out as blisters, it develops into pustules, and then it can uh, become honey-colored crusts. And you're going to usually treat it topically, but it is possible you may need to use a systemic antibiotic for it. The thing with empatigo is it's very contagious. And if you don't treat it, it can get worse, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The other thing you may see is folliculitis, furunculosis, and carbunculosis. And I just love saying those three. <laughs> I say that saying like 10 times fast. Anyway, it's the hair follicles that get infected. So anywhere there's hair, you could have these. Again, this is our old friend Staph aureus. But if the person, like if you have a swimming pool in your facility or a hot tub, they may also have pseudomonas that causes the folliculitis, furunculosis, and carbunculosis. Folliculitis is a superficial. Uh, treated with a topical. And then what ends up happening is uh, you'll start to see, if it's not treated, the, the furuncles will form. So this is red painful lumps. Um, kind of down in here you see that might be folliculitis or furunculosis. They, um, they start to, the lumps start to fill with pus. They grow bigger. They become more painful. They rupture and drain. And then if you don't take care of them, then it develops into carbunculosis. And so this is where you have lateral extensions, you have destruction of tissue, the formation of interconnecting abscesses. So in the furuncles, it's interconnecting under the skin, but now under the carbuncles, it becomes uh, abscesses. And both of those you're going to need to treat with systemic antibiotics. So another thing you may see is called eczema, and eczema is uh, really, um, it, it's, it's what happens when you don't treat impetigo. So that brown crustiness now becomes thicker crust, it ulcerates. Um, and, and the reason I put this in is because it's seen often in homeless people, and I know there's some uh, communities that I work with that have been bringing some homeless folks in. So you may see this, you know, upon admission. Again, caused by Staph aureus, Strep pyogenes. Um, it's going to be systemic antibiotics and the warm compresses to kind of soothe that irritation. The next two, Intratrigo and Erythrasma, are both associated with folds of skin. And so obesity is one of the risk factors for it. So intratrigo, you know, you have the folds of skin, they are rubbing up against each other, you end up with macerations, damages to the skin. 
uh, and a bacterial infection, and then it can often be super infected with a yeast. And so what ends up happening is, and I, I clearly remember this from my nursing tasks, where we treated the intratrigo with uh, an antifungal, and it didn't resolve. And it didn't resolve because there was another infection actually prior to it, a, a bacteria. And so you really need to treat both of them. So you're going to use uh, emollients to, you know, to keep the skin softer, a non-adhesive dressing, something like an ABD pad to keep the, this area dry and also to keep the fold of skin apart so that they're not rubbing against each other. Usually topical treatments are, are, are what you would use for this. Um, erythrasma is similar. It's um, infection on the skin folds. Again, obesity, diabetes, but this is called, caused by Carinobacterium, and it looks brown and scaly patches. And, uh, and our next slide actually shows us some pictures. So Exina that I talked about, the um, uh, exacerbation of uh, intratrigo, uh, no, sorry, of um, impetigo, and then the intratrigo. Uh, so here's you know the redness that you see, and, and it's at least a bacterial infection, if not a fungal infection. And the erythrasma, so it's, you know, the brown is demarcated pretty clearly. You kind of see those brown, crusty areas of it also. So now we're going to talk about viruses. Um, and there are a number of viruses that cause skin infection. The most common, very common in, across the world, is herpes simplex virus, or HSV. So type 1, typically the oral facial, this is your cold sore. Type 2 is usually genital, referred to as herpes. Um, these viruses become latent, and they go into the sensory ganglia. And then at some point, they end up being um, reactivated, and they move back out. And that's where you get that kind of uh, seasonal cold sore on your lip. Uh, kind of thing. Th though these are facial, oral, and genital, they really can occur anywhere on the body. And this is an electron microgram of that HSV. There's many of them. They're icosahedral shape. Um, the next one we'll talk about is varicella zoster virus. And this is ZZV. It causes chicken pox when you're young. Um, it can be when you're old too, but generally when you're young. And same as the HSV, it moves into the nerves and then it hangs out near the spinal cord or the brain and it's inactive. And then at some point it's reactivated and it moves back down that nerve. And so that's where you get these kind of tracks along the nerves. So this is typically where you would see it. It's uh, on the right or left side of the torso. It's a strip. It's a painful rash. Uh, I will say that 10 to 25 percent involves the trigeminal uh, nerve, which is your eye nerve, and that is a medical emergency because it can cause uh, blindness. So there are a number of things that predispose you to shingles. Being older, I'm afraid to say anything over 50, um, typically you have a higher risk for shingles, though there are younger people who get them. And the risk increases as you get older. So there's some estimates that about 50% of people 80 or older will have shingles. And that's why that uh, Zostavax is really important because may prevent but certainly will reduce severity of the shingles. Another virus is herpes, human herpes virus. This is not the same as herpes simplex. This is what causes Epstein-Barr. It also causes uh, Carposi sarcoma, which you see pictured here, and that's associated with HIV and AIDS. Another virus is human papilloma virus. You, know, you often see commercials for this. It's warts. It is usually benign, but it can cause cancer. So here's a cartoon of what the HPV virus looks like. And this is actually HPV warts on a penis. And then I had to put this variola virus, which is small toxin, for historical reasons, because it's so phenomenal that we were able to eradicate a virus from the world. It is no longer seen in the world ever. And what blows my mind is 1949, the U.S. eradicated it. And it was all through vaccination, by the way. That's how we did it. We got rid of this horrible disease through vaccination. In 1977 was the last case in the world. And I remember 
them looking, because I was in high school at the time, I remember them looking for small pox, pox uh, you know, people who have smallpox. So this is what it would have looked like. It is no longer seen in the world. Um, there are smallpox, there's variola virus in deep freeze in many countries around the world. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so, and then the other one, just to kind of keep in mind, is rubella or German measles. Not common in adults, but it is possible. And the problem with adults is that you end up with these complications that are not, uh, not good. So now I'm going to move on to the fungus. Uh, I guess I could say there are fungus among us. Uh, the mo one of the most common is Canada alicans. And uh, canada canadiasis, which is disease caused by Canada, is common with, again, obesity and, and diabetes are, are two old enemies here. And of course, they need moisture and warmth. Um, canada yeast are normally found on your skin, in, in moist areas, also in the mucous membranes, in your digestive system. And they don't cause any problems. The problem happens when there's an upset in the normal flora and fauna. So you think about thrush. Somebody's on antibiotics, their mouth bacteria are all killed, and the Canada yeast just takes over, right? So that's what ends up happening. So typically, you can get candidiasis in different places around your body, and the symptoms are going to depend on what part of the body is infected. So mouth, throat, esophagus, and vagina. You can also have invasive candidiasis where it goes systemic, and that, that is definitely not a good thing. Um, so here's a um, micrograph of the dark dots are the Canada yeast cells. And then this is uh, human tissue that it's growing in. I wanted to mention the onychomycosis, the nail fungus, uh, very common in older people. We, we treat it with, uh, I remember putting, you know, topical fungal creams on people's toes. Um, while they're in bed, that kind of thing. But, but in reality, the only thing that's going to get rid of it is oral antifungals for up to six months, and then very commonly it comes back. So it's just something to kind of, uh, kind of keep in mind. I also wanted to let you know that there is an emerging new Canada called Canada Auris, A-U-R-I-S. And it is um, now becoming a serious health threat around the globe. It's been reported in several countries. The problem with it is that it attacks people who are severely ill, who are in hospital. And then the other problem is that it's resistant to many antifungal drugs. So, you know, unfortunately, we have problems with resistance, not just with bacteria, but also with fungus. So the other common uh, fungal skin infection is tinea. So here we're talking about ringworm, athlete's foot, jock itch. Um, these are commonly caused by the fungus Epidermophyton phloxum and trichophyton species. So they are contagious by touch, uh, also damp surfaces. So we think about you know athlete's foot and showers, that kind of thing. Um, there are predisposing factors for getting any of the tinea infections, and that includes use of antibiotics, topical steroids, diabetes, psoriasis, peripheral vascular disease, poor nutrition, and immunosuppression or immunosuppressive drugs. So when we talk about um, tinea pedis or athlete's foot, besides having athlete's foot, if you have either that, tinea pedis, or nail fungus, it's thought to be a risk factor for recurrent cellulitis, because now it's cracking the skin, breaking it open, and giving a portal of entry for bacterial pathogens to cause cellulitis. Uh, tinea manum is, typically looks like contact dermatitis, and, and the funny thing about it is uh, it's either on the hands or on both feet in one hand. I don't know why, but that's, that's where it's typically found. So um, here's some pictures. So this is uh, athlete's foot between the toes. Uh, tinea corpus is, uh, you can see that it's this red kind of scaly lesion. Um, and it can worsen. So this is on darker skin what it would look like. When it worsens, what happens is you get inflammation, you get scaling and crustiness, papules, vesicles on that advancing border there. Uh, now somebody who is immunocompromised 
or maybe has HIV will have an atypical presentation of tinea corpus. So they may have deep abscesses or else it's disseminated throughout the skin. So it may not um, manifest itself the same as, as, this, uh, as, as, as this circle. And then many, a tinea manum, I mentioned that it looks like dermatitis, but it, it can also affect nails. So now I'm going to talk about the parasites. And I will tell you guys right off now, as I was rehearsing this and I'm talking about these parasites, I started itching myself. So hopefully you all won't be doing that. <laughs> so we're going to start with scabies. And of course, scabies is caused by a human itch mite called Sarcoptes scabii. Um, it's seen, as you can see here, on the arm, its hands, wrists, arm, uh, axilla, breast, lower abdomen, gluteal folds, inner thighs. It's seldom seen on the face. And the clinical presentation that you see here, this crustiness, uh, these, these lines that are caused by the scabies mite crawling underneath the skin, um, you may not see that in, in elders. They may not show those kinds of symptoms. What you might see is itching. I distinctly remember uh, somebody that I uh, helped take care of who that exactly is what happened to them. Uh, they, were, um, they were itchy um, and we couldn't figure out what it was. And it took a long time before we diagnosed it as scabies. And the way you're going to do that is to actually uh, look at it visually under a microscope and, uh, and see the, the little bug here, uh, this, this mite, and that's a drawing of it. So um, besides the topical anti-mite, you're also going to do things like um, make sure that you are, um, oh, so it's spread directly, skin-to-skin -skin contact, but also infested bedding. And that's why you want to make sure that you're cleaning the bedding as well as the area around it. Because the mite can actually survive for three to four days without being on a human. So uh, you really want to clean the, the surrounding area. Uh, pediculosis is lice, so this is, um, you know, lice typically are head, body, or pubic area where they're called um, crabs. These are ectoparasites, they're an insect that feeds on blood. And, and with these, again, itching is the main thing, and you want to disinfest the clothing and the bedding. And then, of course, bed bugs, this is one of the, you know, hot items, I guess, out there, especially for people who travel. Uh, they're an insect, and you see they're very tiny, just two or three millimeters in, in uh, length and width. Interestingly, people who are over 65 usually do not have a reaction to the bite. Um, but if they do, you're going to treat that bite with antihistamines, a topical anesthetic, and then you basically just wait for it to resolve. Uh, interesting, I was at a nursing home where they had an infestation in a room and they had the exterminator in and they were having a hard time finding the bed bugs. They actually brought in a bed bug sniffing dog to find them. Bed bugs give a particular odor and I'm guessing that's what the dog is, uh, is, is looking at or, or sniffing at, I should say. So these aren't very common, but they're things to keep in mind. The worms, the helminths, so hookworm, um, it, it is from infected feces, so the immature worm penetrates the skin, usually on the foot or lower leg, uh, and this is typically what it looks like. It's a localized rash. It's an intensely itchy rash. Um, it's going to migrate through the body to the digestive system to complete its life cycle. And then um, enterobiasis or pinworms, again, not super common. Usually you see these in kids, but it is passed from person to person, uh, and it causes pruritus ani, so itching around the anus. Uh, and then this last one is really just the only example of protozoa that causes um, skin infections. You're probably never going to see it. It's uh, leishmaniasis, and it's equatorially found. But, you know, you never know. People may be traveling. So if you ever see something that kind of looks like this uh, and they've been traveling somewhere equatorial, you might want <laughs> to think about it. So now we have our third poll. 
And this is our last one, and we're going to be talking about prevention. So what is the best way to prevent skin infection? But I'm hoping that, you know, you guys did not say take prophylactic antibiotics because we very well know and we're going to hear more about uh, why we would not use antibiotics because of antibiotic resistance. And yes, the grand majority of you chose to be preventative and keep skin intact and use barrier creams where necessary. So let's talk a little bit about prevention. So the, you know, the ideal thing is to, to keep that skin intact and healthy because that's the principal barrier against invasion of the skin. So and we know that we talked about very early in the webinar that elderly skin is fragile. It's thin, it's at risk to damage, especially if the person is incontinent because it adds, you know, that moisture, heat, and friction to it also. So you want to use a moisture barrier. You want to use an emollient, petroleum or dimethicone because that helps keep the skin flexible. You want to use an occlusive agent because that helps waterproof. Zinc oxide is going to help with maceration. It's also going to prevent, if the person is, has fecal incontinence, Zinc oxide will also prevent the, the digestive juices from chewing up the skin. And when we talk about cleansers, we want to use something that's pH balanced. I mentioned before that the skin is acidic, the pH is 4 to 4.5, and yet many soaps that we use are alkaline, they're 9 to 12, so quite a difference. So if you're using that alkaline soap on an acidic skin, it's going to lead to drying of the skin. You're going to have those micro fissures and cracks in the skin. On top of that, the normal flora and fauna, which also help as a protection against some of the bad bacteria and bad fungus that could get in, um, and the balance of those is going to be destroyed with that high pH. When we think about hands and feet, we know that they're at high risk also for injury, and so of course they're going to be higher risk for infections. We talk about skin tears on the elderly because of, again, that re the skin is, is uh, not as closely tied together, the epidermis and the dermis layers. And so are we encouraging the elderly to wash their hands with gentle, low pH products using moisturizers. If they're prone to repeated skin tears, do we put prophylactic dressings in those areas to prevent uh, more skin tears? Um, so those are the kinds of things that we can do. We also want to manage comorbidities. You know, we talked about diabetes over and over again. We talked about obesity over and over again. So managing those things to help um, prevent wounds from occurring, to help prevent infections from occurring. We want to make sure that our elders are eating well, that they're keeping well hydrated, um, that we're you know, doing the blood work we need to make sure that they're getting enough protein. When family and friends visit, are they using good hand hygiene? Do we have products for them to use that are easy for them to access? Are residents using good hand hygiene? Are we encouraging them to wash their hands before and after dinner, before and after using the bathroom? Um, are we, do we have gentle products for them to use? And is staff using good hand hygiene? You know, it's always an issue, and there will be an upcoming webinar that touches on this. But I just read a study last week that showed that CNAs are not changing gloves at the appropriate time during care. And so now they have contaminated gloves that they're spreading things. And I think this was seen in about 40% of those CNAs across several uh, long-term care facilities. So are we encouraging and are we reminding people to use you know, good hand hygiene and good preventative uh, practices? So what should we consider if the person does get an infection? Well, of course we want to know etiology. What's causing the skin problem? Is it an infection, in fact, or is it some other issue? Um, so we're going to look at the skin lesion. Does it have the typical inflammatory responses? Is it tender, erythema, edema, warmth? Is there fever present? But of course, we always keep in the back of our mind that elderly and those who are immunocompromised are not going to have those classic symptoms. In fact, they may not even have 
the typical lab findings on their blood work or other things because of their attenuated immune response. So we always want to, you know, the big picture, we want to look at the big picture. We're going to do diagnostic testing, including swabs and cultures, and we want to do those as soon as possible so that we can find the causative agent and use the proper treatment. So if it's a bacteria, we're going to use an antibiotic. If it's a fungus, we're going to use an antifungal, et cetera. We also want to assess the extent of the involvement. So by doing blood cultures to see if it's septic, um, you know, are we going to then use an oral or a topical? And that's going to help us to determine what treatment that we're using. We're going to look at differential diagnoses also, and this is going to help us be successful in our therapy because when you do a differential diagnosis, you're going to know the thorough knowledge of that person's clinical history, their immune status, their current health status. You know, sometimes it's hard to diagnose those skin infections because they may masquerade as other kinds of clinical syndromes. And I, just a simple example is the scabies I talked about, where it's just itching, where you might think it's just dry skin when that's not it. So you really need to do a thorough assessment if you suspect that there's a skin infection. Of course, you want to do that for everything, right? So what else should we consider if there's a skin infection? So the treatment, of course, and the principles of treating a skin infection um, are going to be the same whether the person is elderly or not. But um, there are some things to keep in mind for the elderly in particular. For example, if you're using a topical antibiotic, uh, for the elderly, you may have dermatitis associated with that antibiotic because of their more fragile skin. In general, you don't want to use a topical antibiotic for more than two weeks. If it doesn't resolve in two weeks, there's something else going on, and you need to figure out what that is. With the systemic antibiotics, of course, that has got to be bacteria only. Uh, antiseptics might be something that you want to think about. Um, you know what, let me go back to antibiotics for a second because I forgot to mention with the elderly and antibiotics, it's just like any other drug. Um, you want to think about pharmacokinetics. Um, it's going to be different in the elderly. So absorption, distribution, metabolism is all going to be different. The, the antibiotic may interact with the different medications they're taking, so you may have the increased adverse effects or you may have a, a, a decrease in the effectiveness of the antibiotic because of those interactions. Um, there may be some issues with the antibiotics and comorbidities uh, or the reduced liver or kidney function. So those are the kinds of things because we're working mostly with elders that you keep in mind when you're giving them a, a systemic antibiotic. So now the antiseptics, um, those can be used topically, but there's not a lot of evidence because mostly they're used around prevention on intact skin. But um, hydrogen peroxide cream, chlorhexidine, even something like tea tree oil um, have been used for minor skin infections. So it is possible to use them. When we talk about dressings, you know, if you're talking about an infected wound in protect particular or something that's oozing, uh, th th these are just kind of general rules of thumb. What I would suggest is that you talk, if you want specifics or you're really struggling, like what kind of dressing should I put on this particular infection or this particular uh, infected wound, you may want to talk directly to your rep because uh, the, you know, they're selling you products and they have a lot of knowledge about the specifics of those specific products. So you, you probably want to talk to them and get their input. Um, and they'll come in and do education for you also. But in general, you know, if it's a wound, you want to maintain the most moist wound bed. And then like alginates and foams if, you're, if you have a lot of exudate. Um, and if you need some auto debridement, most Dressings will do auto debridement, but hydrogels are particularly good at that. And if you want to promote granulation, you're starting to resolve that uh, infection and you want to do some healing, get the healing going, the hydrocolloids might be something that you want to consider. So treatments, um, of course, you want to, uh, you're going to not only treat 
the infection, but you're also going to look at other things. You want it to be multi-pronged. You want it to be holistic. What's causing, what's the underlying, what's the root cause? So, uh, and then also you want to look at accompanying symptoms. So do symptom control, you know, calm the itching with an antihistamine or a steroid. Keep the skin moist and supple. Um, you know, uh, maybe maybe do a, a little uh, something around the area to prevent, you know, like maybe that's where you would want to use a, uh, uh, you know, some an antiseptic around the area to prevent it from spreading. Using non-drug therapies like cold compresses or other comfort measures also. And please, please don't forget any associated pain because some of these are pretty painful and we way under treat pain anyway. Um, so don't forget that. You know, if the infection is complicated, you may need to hospitalize them. And, and a good rule of thumb is, you know, your treatment should depend on your severity. So that rule of nines. So if the, over 9% of the body is involved in that infection, you should consider it severe. And that's where you would have more aggressive treatment. And again, that's where the hospitalization may come in. So the goal of any treatment, of course, is to you know, get rid of that infection and then enhance the healing process if it's possible to do so. So in summary, I would like to say that there are many causes of skin infections besides bacteria. And for elderly, you know, the population we mostly work with, there are many risk factors. And of course, prevention is the best medicine. It's, <laughs> prevention is best because we want to take good care of its skin, and we want to do good hygiene, including good hand hygiene. So um, here are some references. They're, they're in your handouts. And I want to thank you. And it, you are more than welcome to reach out and contact me at, at any point. And I will now turn the, pro the program back over to Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. That was a very informative presentation that contained valuable information I think everyone can use in their organization. Um, that does conclude our slide presentation portion of the program. Now we'd like to begin our question and answer period. First one, uh, it, it's rare to find a dermatologist that still scrapes for scabies in nursing home residents. Uh, can you provide some reasons why this might be the case? So uh, uh, let's see. I missed part of that question. It's, it's rare but to it's, find a dermatologist that, that... That scrapes for scabies. Oh, scrapes for scabies. Uh, and they want to know why that is? Yes. Um, geez, honestly, I don't know. Um, there, I've heard a lot of, you know, kind of, I'm not familiar with a lot of dermatologists, but I've, I've heard some kind of, I don't know what you would call it, uh, maybe folk medicine kind of things, where I've heard people who will actually use like a Sharpie to uh, delineate the, the scabies under the skin, like their little tunnels and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if it's because they feel like the skin is fragile and they would cause more harm than good. Um, tape is always a good way to pull up those little bugs if you can, um, if they're on the surface. Uh, I would just, you know, try and encourage them and try and really, you know, present all the data that you have that would indicate that this might be scabies and, and really kind of, um, you know, push them to, um, to do it, and if you can't get a dermatologist, then maybe your medical director can um, can look at it too. Okay. Uh, our next question is: This the facility they use dial soap for residents that have frequent skin infections? Is that an appropriate mm -hmm. intervention, or is there something else they could be doing to help those that are susceptible to recurrent skin infections? Well, I mean, I don't think um, so. I I'm trying to I'm trying to dance around the dial question. What I would say is that many soaps, and I think Dial might be one of these, is their pH is high. And so you want something that's going to be very gentle as a cleansing agent, whether the person has infections or not. Um, and, and I would not rely on the soap to kill that um, infection either. You probably want to use something like uh, antibiotic cream to kill the infection. But really just cut, uh, I don't have a dial bottle in front of me, but they should have the information or you should be able to get it off of uh, off the internet as to what the pH is on it. And that's really what you want to look at. You want to look at something that's either pH neutral or, or slightly uh, acidic and not a high pH. And maybe even moisturizing too. 
gentleness is what you want to go with. Thank you. I do see one more, Chris, in the, uh, and it's about a problem with not treating toenail fungus. And I can answer that really quickly. Um, yeah, you, it's not really necessary to treat toenail fungus unless it starts to become painful or debilitating. So, uh, you, you know, you can, you can let it go. You know, I would definitely, um, you know, see what the docs say about that also. Okay, great. Thank you. And this concludes our webinar. Thank you.